Hello, dear Professor Rubana Hook. Uh, we are delighted to have you here today for the interview. You're Vice Chancellor of the Asian University of Women in Bangladesh and former but first female president of the uh, BGMEA, an entrepreneur of one of the renowned textile industry named Muhammadi Group. The textile industry in Bangladesh is crucial for the nation's economic growth and workforce well-being. As a prominent entrepreneur, the first female president of Bangladesh Garment Manufacturers and Exporters Association, and an academician, your initiatives and contributions are shaping the nation. Can you give us a brief overview of your current work and initiatives in terms of a more sustainable industry? Thank you, Christina, for the question and for the intro. Um, you see, the tag of sustainability is so overly used today that we often pause to wonder whether um, whether the practices related to sourcing are also sustainable. It's just not about the manufacturers being sustainable. It's a question of everybody putting in their bits to become sustainable. So in terms of the journey that the industry is currently undergoing, it's all about sustainable strides and sustainable practices. But you see, you know, today we almost consume more than 1.7 times more of the resources that we have right now compared to what we used to do before. Um, you know, it's also a question of the entire industry going forward with the concept of circular economy. It's all about closing the loop. It's all about making sure that um, we use, reuse um, everything that we have. Now, the point is, in, in this regard, the country must have, Bangladesh must have a national circular economy policy through which you know we or the manufacturers will also be incentivized to do better. So everybody needs to be in it. As far as the industry goes, we have more than 200 um, green factories, LEED certified green factories. Um, if you ask me whether certification means a lot, I would say, yes, it does. But also at the same time, uh, compliance or uh, sustainability is just not about ticking boxes. It's about everyone literally internalizing the practices. You know, it's not about um, a certified tap on your bathrooms. It's about being more innovative. You know, it's, we don't need expensive taps to make sure that, you know, the water consumption is less. We can easily add a ring inside the tap mouth, mouth of the tap and make sure that, you know, there's lesser flow. So I think there is a need uh, a substantial need for local um, innovation. So local capacity building is a must. And in order to do that, everyone, including the workers, the owners, the mid-level managers, the, the NGOs, the academic institutions, everyone must come together so that we can literally frame the policy of zero waste. And... Um, you know, we also need to depend on renewable energy, which is currently less than 5% in Bangladesh. We need to push that bar also. So as far as we are concerned, you know, we have done our bit. Lots of due diligence has been done. Lots of reports have been published. In reality, we just need to be a little better. And it's not possible to be a, to be a little better unless we are auditing every step that we have taken so far. So with 200 lead certified factories, more than 75, which are platinum, uh, it's great news for Bangladesh, but it just doesn't stop there. We need to have international collaboration and support, especially from the buyer's end, in order to assure that the, that the journey towards sustainability is upheld. Very inspiring. Thank you so much. Um... What do you think are the most important actors here to drive this change? Uh, what are the most important stakeholders um, to make uh, towards uh, to get towards a more sustainable development of the industry? I think a collective action plan needs to be inked. 
I think in that action plan, we need academia to be involved. Because, you know, in our industry, there's a huge disconnect between academia and industry. Academics think of one thing, they dig deeper, but they don't also look at the total surface. So while they're digging into one special topic, you know, the industry has moved on uh, to other uh, areas and discourses. So I think um, an all-inclusive discourse is needed around sustainability, in which manufacturers need to be there, of course, but of course, you know, NGOs, uh, stakeholders uh, from academia, um, obviously brands and retailers, everybody, and especially the government, all of them need to be there. Uh, without that, because, you know, we the government is now talking about green financing, uh, which is great, but, you know, the preconditions also need to be flexible and, uh, you know, the conditions cannot just be set. Also needs active engagement of all the relevant stakeholders. So I think an all-inclusive national policy needs to be uh, framed with the participation of all the critical stakeholders that I've already mentioned. I completely agree. And I give now the word to our second interviewer, it's Kamal Gomez, one of our PhD students. Floor is yours. Thank you, Christina. So yes, Professor Rogana Hawk, I would like to focus in this section on business and bridging gap between academia and industry. So we know that textile, thousands of text, textile companies affiliated with BGME are upholding their commitment to compliance matters like wastewater control. However, there are over several thousands other textile firms in Bangladesh that are not part of BGME and are neglecting compliance responsibilities. This situation poses risks to the environment and the balance of ecosystems. How can BGME strategically lead effort to unite these non-compliant industries considering social and ecological factors to mitigate the environmental crisis? Thank you, uh, Mr. Gomez. I, I think it's a beautiful question. It's just that BGME cannot be responsible for this. You know, the manufacturers cannot be responsible for other manufacturers. I mean, at one point in my life, I did tell New York University that, you know, we should have the buddy system where one manufacturer can help out five others. But in terms of sustainability, it's very difficult because especially if it's textile, if it's just ready-made garments, it's still okay. But if it's textile, then it's a huge responsibility. In that, in that perspective, I seriously think the government should have a map of compliance so that they can map you, they can bring every factory under consideration and you know conduct surveys and assessments and see you know where they're lacking. Now, a small factory, very often, Mr. Gomez, what happens is small factories which don't even export are perhaps just doing internal market production. Um, you know, if something happens there, if there's a fire or if there's something breaking down there, it still reflects on the entire um, RMG industry of Bangladesh. So everybody needs to be noticed. I think uh, the slogan should be that no one should go unnoticed by the government. Uh, the government has an inspection system called Lima, which is done with the help of ILO. Uh, my point is if they also include a few other points of compliance there, including um, abuse of textile waste, then, you know, we would have a complete picture from the government's end in order to make sure that all of us are in it together. Otherwise, you know, it's not possible for the manufacturers or BGME as an institution to go and really hunt down factories uh, which are not compliant. Uh, thank you, Professor Robana Hawk, for your insightful thoughts regarding these compliance issues. So there is another um, complementary questions. So we know textile sectors prioritize generally R&D for product and design innovations. As a textile industry owner and researcher, do you see the potential for collaborative R&D 
I mean, research and development involving mid-level managers, decision makers, academia, and students to enhance the ecosystem synergies and how? Okay, so R&D could be in terms of machine and, you know, uh, R&D could be in term, could be regarded as, um, you know, upskilling. R&D can be in terms of design. So the different components of R&D, where do we want to concentrate the most? Uh, you see, the biggest challenge for Bangladesh is also efficiency. So we need to make sure that whatever resources we have are used optimally. In that case, um, an all-inclusive collaboration with um, the students or with the engineers in order to make sure that our factories are fully upgraded and in times of you know, 4IR, at least the existing machinery in a semi-robotic condition, at least the existing machinery should be functional uh, function optimally. I think that's one. Number two, Bangladesh does a lot of basics. For instance, $6 billion is only on basic t-shirts. So value addition is, is pretty much low. For us to be guided by leading fashion houses of Europe or to have academic input in terms of fashion would be great. If you know a couple of fashion gurus could come and guide us in terms of um, predictions, you know, market predictions, um, and and uh, you know, sort of make us more accustomed to the to the idea of um, high value added products instead of just t-shirt. If we could just do you know female fashion, women fashion for women, um, and and do dressier gowns, nicer tops, trousers better suits, I mean, we would instantly have more value addition. You know, Bangladesh, um, the, the world basically sources almost $9 billion worth of just man-made fiber-based blouses, women's blouses. But Bangladesh supplies less than 300 million. So there's an untapped potential there and, and we lag behind because we don't have enough design input. So if fashion houses could come forward internationally and collaborate with us, um, I think that would, that would be great. So very recent initiative of ours has been um, doing Jamdani jackets. Now, Jamdani is, uh, is a local hand-woven uh, fabric. And based on that, we've now, you know, I can send you pictures of beautiful Jamdani jackets that we have done, that we have just uh, sent to uh, Chicago. So very few in number, but that's where the tar target is. I hope I've answered your question. Okay, thank you, Professor. You really uh, said that actually eco-friendly production is very important right now for the environmental, to mitigate the environmental crisis. So another question I would like to ask you, many women still face stereotypes and biases that discourage them from pursuing careers in STEM, that is uh, science, technology, engineering, and math. You already mentioned about the technology and engineering. So, or leadership positions. How can educational institutes like uh, Asian University for Women play a role in breaking down these stereotypes and nurturing confidence in young women? You see, the lack of women participation in STEM is pretty global. Uh, it's just not in Bangladesh. But of course, in Bangladesh, you know, um, women in STEM are even less. So um, ours is, is more of a liberal arts college. But uh, what we intend to do is, of course, gradually, you know, up our mark because um, we see increased interest from uh, female students in computer science. Now, we have a course that is run by Harvard on CS50, which is pretty intense, but we encourage women to do, go, go for that. We have, we run a program with Stanford University on computer science bridge program, which is very successful. We also have Google certification courses for our students. I mean, even at a pre-undergraduate level, which we have in our university, we give serious stress to even programs like 
Python. So irrespective of a, of a student who may or may not take uh, science majors, she still needs to go through basic programming. So for us, coding, I think, is critical for Bangladesh. I think it's important for us to, for all of us to realize that there is no other way but to be more STEM friendly uh, in our journey towards progress. So um, I absolutely endorse the fact that, you know, um, STEM must be prioritized in Bangladesh and of course, globally. Yes, thank you, Professor. Uh, right now, I would like to uh, offer this, the next section to Christina, please. Christina. Thank you. Yeah, I will stay with the topic on women empowerment and social sustainability. And the next question is about women empowerment and leadership. As a successful woman leader in both academia and the corporate world, what key strategies do you believe are essential for fostering women's empowerment and leadership development in traditional male-dominated industries? Education. In one word, it's education. So way back in 2015, when I was not the vice chancellor of Asian University for Women, I was on the board and I did propose to AUW that we should bring in more and more ready-made garment workers to the university. Now that at that point sounded like a dream and a utopia, but uh, it happened. I mean, what the university did was the founder of the university is Kamal Ahmed. He's a lawyer, he lives in Boston. What he did was he basically picked the point and uh, he started a pre-undergrad program called Pathways for Promise for the ready-made garment workers. So they went through almost two, two and a half years of extensive a training at the university before they started taking undergrad classes. So their math had to be strong, their English had to be strong, their computer literacy had to be strong. So they were trained to become part of the university and then they went into the university. And of course there was a question of social immersion also because this is a university where we have 87% funded uh, students, but 13% are also fee paying. So many wealthy kids also come to the university. So it's a stark difference, you know, uh, women from the most underserved communities coming into the university and studying along with the students from, you know, more comfortable backgrounds, wealthier backgrounds. It's a social synergy that needs to be nurtured. So th it wasn't just about education. It was about the, the coming together um, you know, it was about inclusion. It was not only about excellence, but it was also about inclusion, which I feel is is a major part of excellence. Unless you're inclusive, you will never be able to be the best. So uh, I think education is is key. I mean, I uh, in a in a random interview that I did uh, conduct um, on my uh, workers. 56 of them, I asked them whether they had ever dreamt of becoming entrepreneurs. And all of them said no. They couldn't even dream that they would ever become entrepreneurs. But when I asked the 70 graduates of AUW who were from the, who were formerly garment workers about their aspiration and if they had ever thought about becoming entrepreneurs, all of them raised their hands. So you see, they're from the same background. They were garment workers. But now, because of the insertion or intervention of education, you know, hope is there. So it is definitely education that takes a woman to the next level. It is definitely education that is an enabler for women empowerment and nothing else beyond that. So out of that whole thing, I mean, when, when they said that, yes, they would want to become entrepreneurs, four of them have already started their own companies. So they've started their buying house and eventually, you know, they want to be uh, garment manufacturers and have their own factories, which is fantastic. But, you know, they, they never thought that they would be able to even dream about becoming entrepreneurs themselves. And this is what education does, I guess. Yeah, sounds great. Thank you. 
And you already mentioned uh, some initiatives, but during your tenure as the first female president of the BGMEA, what measures did you take to address gender inequality within the garment industry? And what challenges do, do you also encounter? And what were, were the outcomes you achieved? Well, the, the ready-made garment workers going to the university was one initiative that I made sure that at least 100 of garment workers were going to go to the university. So that was one. Of, of course, reskilling was another thing. There were lots of projects which started at that point, which were addressing um, upskilling of the garment workers. So basically, skill improvement, sending them to the universities, making sure that there were sufficient complaint portals all around the country so that they could at least voice their you know, discomfort or protest. That was one thing. So um, there was, we, during my tenure, I think we had almost 1,200 um, sexual harass anti-sexual harassment committees set up in the factories. Um, if you ask me how well they're working now, I have no idea. But the question is, you know, this is also a point that we should all take back home. We often start initiatives and don't know what's happening after all at the end. We don't know whether the right people are in the right places, whether it's not just about forming committees or it's not about forming policies. It's about following it down to the detail and making sure you know, that good initiatives are happening and are being sustained. So you see sustained good practices or sustainability of good practices must be audited. You know, and it's it's not on anybody else to audit. It's it's us who need to be responsible ourselves. I mean, I have to individually make sure that my factory is ahead of anyone else's because, you know, we pledge sustainability. And if you really want sustainable female empowerment in this country, concerted efforts must be taken in order to ensure that. I mean, I can only tell you, as the first female president, I didn't have it easy at all. I had a board which had 34 male directors and only me as a female leading the team. It wasn't easy. So even sitting within the elite bubble that I represent, um, pretty much disconnected from the rest of the reality. Um, even I suffered. So you can well imagine what happens to the woman at the factory level. I mean, one complaint um, of a factory worker may cause a lot of discussion, but does it really change the, the, the scenario? In order to have more impactful change and in order to have more vocal female representatives, even in the union level. So this is another thing that I'm proud of. We we were the first ones to go ahead and propose to the Ministry of Labor that if there were unions, and if that particular factory had more female workers, then a female would lead the union. So that eventually became part of the law, which was wonderful. So basically, gender will determine leadership. It's also, and I, and I felt that, you know, if a woman leads a trade union, automatically the level of empathy increases. You know, they're more understanding, they, they understand and, and it's easier. You know, they, they don't suddenly go violent because that's not what you want. You want a perfect industrial relation um, dynamics in the factory. So it's important for us to also make sure uh, that the owner side is heard. And the owner also has to have enough empathy to understand the viewpoint of the worker. So um, a sustainable bridge must be also built between owners, mid-level management, and the workers so that the dialogue uh, can remain flowing. Thank you. It gives a perfect bridge to my next question. As you're the owner or one of the owners of a Mohammedi group, how have you witnessed the impact of women's participation in the textile industry? And can you share some specific examples of initiatives uh, towards uh, promoting gender diversity and inclusion within your company? 
I mean, the, the easiest example is, of course, the increase of female supervisors in the factory. I mean, lots of supervisors now are female. Um, at times, we faced hostility, and many women workers said, why would I listen to another female? But, you know, that eventually uh, was overcome. So number of uh, female supervisors have gone up at the factory, which is fantastic. Um, also, the number of merchandisers in the office has gone up. Um, we also made it a rule not to source from uh, vendors who didn't have sufficient female representatives in their boards. So if it was a fabric supplier, I would often ask for um, their shareholdership, shareholding, and ask whether uh, there was female director in the board. Very often they would just make one of their, you know, sisters or wives become the chairman of the board. So I understood that, you know, these were, uh, these were quick fixes that they were doing. But at the end, at least the awareness grew. Everybody knew that unless we have a female member as a director in the board, this company is not going to source from us. So I think it's important for us to also be smart in terms of sourcing uh, strategies. Um, we need to be smart uh, with our training modules so that we give more priority to the female worker. And also very selfishly, you know, female workers don't jump from job to job. Uh, they, they are steady workers who stay for a long time. They don't go to the next factory just because they're offering something exciting. They are more loyal than, than male colleagues. So in our own interest, we must also make sure that we encourage female empowerment in the factory floors and beyond. You gave now so many examples. I hope people uh, hear that and take up some of these in their own work. So thank you so much. And I give back the word to Kamal Gomez. Thank you, Christina. So Professor uh, Hawk, as the uh, first women president and also vice chancellor of a prestigious university in Bangladesh, you have some visions and dreams of the future of the textile industry. So looking ahead, what is your vision for the Asian University for Women's impact on women's education and empowerment? And how do you see your involvement in shaping this vision? Um, you see, in at in Asian University for Women, we have a master's program for education where you know we have um, students from all over. So Asian University for Women has students from 17 countries, including Afghanistan, Yemen, Syria, India, Nepal, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and everyone else. Bhutan and Bangladeshis are 555 in number, and the Afghans are 462 now in number. So what has happened is we we here we train women to become leaders in their own, own areas. So the Masters of Education program encourages the women to learn the tools of education and make sure that you know they can also educate other women. So as, a, as an example, there is a freedom school that the Afghan women have set up in Balochistan where they're teaching children online so that they're able to be educated. And also way back in, in Kabul where Taliban has almost forbidden education. So one prime example is basically encouraging them to become leaders um, in, in, their, in their home, homeland. When they don't have any home, when they have chosen uh, AUW to, to come and study here, I mean, they, of course, dream about going back home someday. And we are hoping when they do go back, um, they lead as much as they can. So again, you know, the spreading of education is, is one thing that could literally infect, positively infect the whole of South Asia. So that's, that's our goal and that's what we do. And my vision is full on quality education, tertiary education for women in this country, because uh, our primary level is 
something that we can't change anymore. I mean, uh, quality education is just not there. Very often we interview people who are unable to write even one page of proper Bangla, let alone English. So the quality of education has dipped in Bangladesh. The numbers have gone up, but the quality has gone down. So it's important for us to ensure that, you know, entry into tertiary education needs to be foolproof and our graduates need to be proper ambassadors of their own countries. Okay, uh, thank you. So you already mentioned about the global collaboration. So in previous discussion, women's empowerment is a global issue. And how can universities, businesses, and governments from different countries collaborate to share the best practices and create a more inclusive world for women? Well, I mean, I think all the international and national universities can form a network of uh, collaborators. And all of us can come and, and share our best, best practices and, you know, have, have a, a common curriculum and a, a common prescription or recommendation to be um, standardized by the governments. Uh, so I, th I think an informal network of universities could also come in force, into force, maybe exchange programs, maybe just, you know, webinars, um, maybe just track to dialogues would help. So I think academic institutions could all come together and, and form a very formal or an informal track to network in order to benefit uh, uh, the purpose of, of women empowerment. Yes, I hope that. So Asian University for Women also will bridge collaboration with some universities in Germany. And mm -hmm. uh, another question uh, to you, Germany is among the top export destinations for textiles from Bangladesh. With this close relationship between Bangladesh and Germany, what type of collaborations do you believe are needed between producers like Bangladesh and consumers like Germany to effectively support reaching social and environmental justice in industrial practices? I think what we need to have is really B2C platforms. So business to consumers directly. I think many of our good stories should also be written on our shirts. Um, we could have a barcode telling the story of the worker. I think um, Western consumers are not even aware of what happens here. I think uh, the, the memory of Rana Plaza has stayed on in their memories. That we have gone beyond it and that we have the highest number of uh, LEED certified green factories, out of the 15 top green factories in the world, 12 are in Bangladesh. Nothing is known to them. So we need brilliant ambassadors, well-meaning ambassadors in Germany um, who would be able to tell the story of Bangladesh. I think the story of Bangladesh needs to be communicated to the consumer directly. And in order to do this direct communication, we need to use social media actively. So we need, again, once again, great social media ambassadors, influencers, who would be able to link the factory to the consumers in Germany so that our side of the story could also be told. Uh, this is the last question to you from my side. How do you imagine uh, the future of the textile industry, particularly in Bangladesh? What actions still need to be actively taken from your perspective to reach this future? I think I've, I've, I've responded to that question already. I've said a number of initiatives can be taken. How do I envision? I envision this industry to be 100% women-led. And I envision this industry to be led by education, by educated women, by leaders who would be able to form effective collaborative networks internationally and uh, change the, the story of Bangladesh and change the perception of Bangladesh, negative perception of Bangladesh that the Western consumer may have. Because after all, you know, apparel is our second skin. So we want a clean second skin and so do the consumers. So it's important for us to make sure that our stories are rightly communicated to the consumers so that instead of paying the $1 t-shirt that they pay for, that $1 that they pay for a basic t-shirt, you know, would be differently looked upon. And that while we also add value addition to the product, the consumers also recognize the 
you know, the hard toil and sweat that goes into the product through uh, the, the garment workers in Bangladesh. So a general change of understanding is required. And in order to do that, we need the young people um, in the West to understand us better, to share our story with the rest of the consumers. Yes, I also believe that the negative perception is changing so in uh, globally, so in Bangladesh, hope that we can reach out uh, the, uh, I mean, prospect, I mean, the textile prospect and also uh, our impression positively, so in globally. So thank you so much, Professor Robana. I'd like to uh, give the floor to Christina, please, Christina. Just a few final words. Thank you so much for your time and your insights into your work. I find it very inspiring. Thank you so much. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, Mr. Gomez. Thank you. Bye. Bye.